Welcome back to Cafe Lab Outreach. My name's Scott. The past few videos we've talked about interpreting EKGs and collecting EKGs, but what, what's one of the things we can do when our EKG shows a symptomatic bradycardia? Especially a profound one, one that's uh, impacting the hemodynamics and is not responding to medication. I always tell people if I'm in that situation, try medications first uh, so you're not electrocuting me once a second. If you do have to electrocute me once a second, try to disguise that fact with some sedation. Uh, but how do we transcutaneously pace? It's kind of a high risk, low volume exercise that we do because we don't see it a whole lot. There's a lot of things that we see. On, it's kind of like a fire extinguisher on the wall. If you have never practiced with that, it's a false sense of security. So seeing that pacing section on your monitor uh, is kind of comforting that it's there, but really is, is something that we don't dive into a whole lot. We put some vital signs with this EKG. This is actual lady that came up to the cath lab. And you see this complete heart block. You've got P waves and then you'll escape with this VTAC looking rhythm. Uh, so put some vital signs with that. Well, most people guess pretty poor, but this lady was uh, 93 years old and therefore her heart rate or her blood pressure was 140 over 80. And she said, sweetie, are you sure I need this procedure? Uh, so obviously she did get her, her temporary wire and then got her permanent pacemaker later on. How do we do this? What are some step, basic steps for transcutaneously pacing? Well, first off, apply your pads and your three lead EKG. Can you pace with just your pads on? Yes, you can, but you cannot see what you're doing. Uh, that will give you asynchronous pacing. Uh, therefore, it will pace regardless of what that patient's doing. If that patient has a high heart rate, it's going to pace. Uh, regardless, because pacers just want to pace. All these uh, parameters tells it when not to pace. Uh, so by actually putting your three lead on and putting your pads on, you set up a demand pacer. So if that patient's heart rate climbs to a normal heart rate, then that pacer will actually turn itself off and just monitor. At the point that patient's heart rate goes below what your minute, what your threshold or what your rate is set on the on the pacer, then it will actually kick back in. So you can pace without your three lead on. If you were in an emergency situation, you could slap them on there and start pacing, uh, but you would not be able to see an EKG. Uh, currently, uh, there's rumor that it's going to change, but currently uh, the pads can only deliver energy in the pacing mode. They can't deliver and see like they can in the fibrillation mode. Uh, so then we're going to set our rate. A lot of the rates are already set according to protocol. When you turn most of these monitors on, there's a preset rate on the screen. Uh, so whatever your protocols are, we definitely want it to be a therapeutic dose and at least faster than their rate uh, so that we know that we have capture, we know we have control. Uh, the second, then finally, we're going to actually dial up the milliamps. So the milliamps are actually the amount of energy that's being sent into the heart trying to gain capture. Uh, and what you want to do is if this patient's unconscious, wrap it up very fast, get your capture, and then come back down. If the patient's conscious, then you want to go up more slowly. Zoll says they capture between 40 and 80 milliamps, and Physio's manual says that they capture between 60 and 90 milliamps. And both of those are from the manufacturer's documentation. One well, reason I'm covering these two are in the area I work, these are the most common monitors we, we run across. Uh, and then if you can sedate that patient or give them some pain relief uh, very quickly, that would be appreciated. So how do we put our pads on? Zoll says that they prefer anterior posterior. So the anterior pad goes where V2 and V3 go, and then the posterior pad goes below the scapula. It actually can deliver less energy if it doesn't have to go through that scapula. Uh, so if you go below the scapula is what Zoll recommends. Physio, on the other hand, says that you can do the anterior posterior or the sternum apex approach. I think most times you're still going to, most of the studies that I read, you're still going to get better results, uh, lower capture with uh, anterior posterior. And then we want to make sure we have capture. There's two forms of capture. One matters more, the, the mechanical capture, but electrical capture is what you're going to be looking at first. So electrical capture means you have a QRS after every pacer spike. But more importantly than just a QRS, you want a T wave. That T wave is, helps you differentiate from artifact. Because what does a T wave represent? Repolarization. It's repolarizing because something depolarized. 
So we're going to actually make sure we have electrical capture. And then we're going to set our milliamps up just a little bit more. Uh, over the years, I've been taught different things. Uh, 10%, uh, one more click. Uh, basically what you want to do is have a little bit of a safety margin. So if that patient's threshold changes for any reason, uh, then that safety margin is already built in. Threshold means that's the minimum energy that you have capture. One click down, you lose capture. You come back up to that, you have capture. Uh, so you're right on that border. So going up just a little bit more gives you a safety margin. And then finally, we want mechanical capture. and We'll spend some time on that. Let's look at this EKG, these EKGs here. We see pacer spikes, we see QRSs, but which of these have ca electrical capture? Well, it's that bottom one. The top one there has periodic capture. Uh, the second one does as well, but that third one has a pacer spike followed by a QRS and a T wave after each one. Remember this discordance is a normal finding. We talked about that in bundle branch blocks uh, and in semi-mimics. The where the QRS goes, the STs go the opposite direction. That's normal in a paced rhythm. So when you look at this right here, as one of the guys that taught us in the fire department at 3 a.m. in a sideways rain, you, that could, you could be convinced that that's electrical capture. Uh, you would not feel mechanical capture with this because both of these represent artifact. Uh, you have uh, a pacer spike and you have artifact. You don't have QRS. You definitely don't have a T wave uh, demonstrating the capture. So how do we confirm capture? We want to confirm capture primarily by a pulse. Where do we check a pulse? Well, we're, going to, we're always taught in emergencies that the carotid offers the lowest uh, pressure to deliver that pulse uh, to that location, but it's hard to look cool when you don't know if you can touch your patient, but you can, you can touch your patient on this, but if you, even if you felt carotid pulse, all of this is contracting. So a femoral pulse is a much better approach uh, to see if you have a, a pulse with that capture. And you also should see some of your other uh, hemodynamic monitors reflect that as well. Your pulse ox. If that's on your finger and you're getting a pulse wave all the way to the finger, that's a pretty good indication there. And that pulse ox should uh, correlate with each heartbeat. And then if you are monitoring your entitled CO2, you're now delivering more exhaust to the smokestack, more CO2 to the lungs, to be measured by the entitled CO2 monitor. Now, this is an example here. You see your, uh, your EKG, then your pulse ox waveform that is associated with that heartbeat. Uh, so for every time you have capture, if you're getting that, you should have an associated uh, pulse ox pleth. What about these buttons on the Zoll and on the Physio? You have a four to one button or a pause button. What do these things do? Well, if you want to see what the patient's underlying rhythm is, you can actually just hit that pause and it takes it down to 25%. So if your rate is 60, it's only going to pace at 15, a quarter of that rate. Uh, that four to one is kind of an odd way of phrasing that, uh, but pause is a little, little bit clearer. Uh, but if you hold those buttons down, it'll decrease your rate down to 25% of what your rate is set. You can see if they're still in their heart blocks or whatever, or the asystole, whatever that's going on. And when you let go, the rate comes right back up. So you didn't have to adjust anything else. So what about magnets over top of regular pacers? This is one thing that, even though this isn't transcutaneous pacing, this is still a very common misnomer when you talk about pacers in the ER and in, in EMS. You talk about magnet over top of the pace, a patient's pacemaker. What does that actually do? Uh, well, a magnet put over top of a patient's pacemaker actually will make it pace. Uh, it makes it pace asynchronously. This comes from surgery. Uh, th these will come wrapped sterilely uh, to where they can actually, anesthesia can set that over top of a pacemaker. And if they're doing any electrocautery work, bovi work, uh, where they use RF frequency to cut through tissue, uh, that can cause artifact and can mess with a pacemaker. Putting a pacemaker in asynchronous mode with a, with a magnet will tell it to just pace at a set rate. And each manufacturer sets that rate. Uh, so the three manufacturers th that are used at my facility, uh, the rates will be 65, 80, or 85, depending on the manufacturer. Uh, so that's what, a pace, that's what a magnet will do over top of someone's uh, implanted pacemaker. This is a transvenous wire coming up from a femoral approach. 
you see that wire coming up the middle and going over into the right uh, ventricle. Uh, the right ventricle is very rough on the inside, all that muscle of the trabeculum. So you can actually just wedge this in, inside of that. Uh, it'll grip on and you can pace that patient at a much lower rate. Uh, this was a right coronary artery occlusion, inferior MI. So you can see that that uh, yellow line shows where the, the RCA would normally track. And once this patient's blood flow is restored, they no longer needed their temporary wire. All right, that's it. I hope that was helpful for a brief overview of transcutaneous pacing and other forms of pacing.